Young girls imagine the same kind of career, but without a tragic ending, while older people often say, now there was a woman who had it all, beautiful, intelligent, and decisive. However, this image is more influenced by movies than by an actual study of readily available facts. The legend of an incredibly beautiful and sensual queen before whom the world's most powerful men bowed began to form after her death. Over different eras, the legend adapted to the demands of the times. Cleopatra was perceived by people sometimes as a just ruler with a string of romantic successes, sometimes as the epitome of a smart beauty with a strong man by her side, and at other times as a calculating careerist who adept monetized her natural beauty. Today, the perception of the Egyptian queen has crystallized into something between Disney's Little Mermaid and the Statue of Liberty. Beautiful, just, authoritative, loyal to her love, and lived somewhere after Adam but before Stalin. As is often the case, the reality is much more complex and, at the same time, more melancholic. In fact, Cleopatra VII Philippata was sequentially married to two of her younger brothers, bore four children, and was the last representative of her royal dynasty. Essentially, all the pillars upon which the modern legend of Cleopatra rests turn out to be myths. Myth 1. The Egyptian. Cleopatra belonged to the Ptolemaic dynasty, often referred to as the Greek or Macedonian lineage. The dynasty was founded by Ptolemy, son of Lagos, a comrade and general of Alexander the Great. Legend even attributes to him a kinship with Alexander the Great himself. Whether true or not, after the Macedonians conquered Egypt, Ptolemy was appointed as the satrap, governor, of the country. He established a dynasty whose members tried to preserve the purity of their blood, which in simple terms means they often married their sisters. There's a theory suggesting that Cleopatra's mother was a concubine, but identifying Cleopatra's nationality is straightforward. The last representative of the Ptolemies was Macedonian or, more broadly, Greek. To her credit, it should be noted that she was perhaps the only member of the dynasty who took the initiative to learn the language of the conquered Egyptian people. Myth 2, the absolute queen. Formally, it's true, Cleopatra was indeed the queen of Egypt. However, she possessed complete power only periodically, and to say she truly ruled an independent state would be a stretch. It's essential to remember that we're discussing the ancient world, where a woman's role was, at least officially, secondary. Cleopatra couldn't reign over Egypt on her own. After her father's death, she shared the throne with her younger brother, Ptolemy XIII. They were officially married, though in practice, the husband was only nine years old when he ascended to the throne, while Cleopatra was 17. Nevertheless, her attempt to rule alone failed. Shielding themselves behind the pharaoh's name, the palace officials effectively drove her out of the capital, seizing power. Her lover, Gaius Julius Caesar, restored the dethroned queen to her position. Wealthy but almost no longer sovereign, Egypt was a close client of the aggressive epic enter of that era, Rome. Caesar, quite timely for Cleopatra, visited Egypt with a significant entourage of his Roman friends, amiable but well, armed legionaries. They overthrew the queen's disgraced brother and husband and placed her on the throne, not forgetting to formally marry her off to another brother, Ptolemy XIV. Becoming the illicit but de facto wife of the all-powerful Caesar, Cleopatra indeed ruled Egypt, but only within the confines favorable to Rome. At times, Caesar, employing the divided impera, divide and conquer, tactic on both Cleopatra and Egypt, blatantly summoned the independent ruler to Rome, closer to him. The period of her reign post Caesar's death is aptly illustrated by the fact that the legionaries left behind in Egypt, without a firm hand guiding them, plundered the locals until Rome intervened and withdrew them from the client state. Her subsequent relationship with Caesar's ally, who governed the eastern part of the empire, Mark Antony, granted Cleopatra more power but still within the parameters convenient for the capital of the world. The ensuing civil war between Antony and Caesar's official heir, the then all-powerful Octavian, led to a catastrophe for both Cleopatra VII and Egypt as a whole. Myth 3, The Unparalleled Beauty This is the most foundational and debated pillar in constructing the Cleopatra cult. 
Paintings dedicated to the Queen, even during the Renaissance, depicted her in line with the beauty standards of that era. If one wishes, they can trace how her portrayal evolved with changing beauty norms. Today's perception is largely influenced by the cinematic fantasies, roles played by Elizabeth Taylor and Vivian Lee, further romanticized by Monica Bellucci. Unfortunately, we cannot ascertain Cleopatra's exact appearance. Photography was still a couple of millennia away, so our discussions are based on busts closest in time to her era. On those identified as Cleopatra's busts, she is depicted as a woman with a large, slightly hooked nose, a narrow forehead, and a thick lower lip. However, the most objective approach in this case would be to consider the opinions of her contemporaries, who surely evaluated her based on their era's standards. Descriptions of the Egyptian queen as a woman of incredible beauty began a few centuries after her death. Interestingly, the same sources also comment on Cleopatra's unprecedented vice. Most of these assessments are questioned by historians, although they did lay the foundation for the legend. The view considered most authoritative is that of the renowned Plutarch, as quoted in his work Parallel Lives. In the section discussing Mark Antony, Cleopatra didn't earn a standalone biography. Among Cleopatra's virtues, he mentions her irresistible charm, the persuasiveness of her speeches, and her incredibly beautiful voice. However, he also notes that her beauty wasn't of the incomparable kind that strikes you at first sight. Plutarch, being the closest historian to the described period and seemingly sympathetic to the last Ptolemaic ruler, offers valuable insight. Most researchers agree that Cleopatra's primary virtues were undoubtedly her intelligence and her ability to find common ground, and thus, approach, with men. Myth 4, sensual and romantic according to legend, Caesar was presented with a rolled carpet, within which Cleopatra was hidden. As the carpet was unfurled, she allegedly appeared suddenly before the powerful Roman, who was immediately captivated by her grace and unmatched beauty. At this point in the tale, the storyteller might pause suggestively, hinting at a scene not suitable for younger listeners. But let's pause and rewind a bit. Lest we upset the romantic sensibilities of young ladies, let's skip the detail about Cleopatra being brought in a sack for bed linens. Instead, let's focus on Caesar. By the time he met the Egyptian queen, he was already past 50. He was a great general, an astute politician, a cunning schemer, and a decisive ruler. His version of romance, however, was, let's say, unique. Caesar was famous for his numerous liaisons, so much so that even his own legionnaires would sing, Hide your wives, we bring to the city the bald womanizer. Of course, Cleopatra's charms played a role in Caesar's decision to support her claim to the Egyptian throne. Still, he calculatedly made her queen, creating a puppet ruler personally loyal to him. It seems mixing business with pleasure was easier for him with a 21-year-old Cleopatra than with her teenage brother as pharaoh. Later, Caesar would commission a gilded statue of his lover, but in his will, he made no mention of her or their joint son, Caesarion. With her next Roman lover, Mark Antony, Cleopatra's enthrallment was certainly deeper. Yet, it required thorough planning and execution. Days of feasts and receptions, flaunting her extraordinary wealth even at the treasury's expense, showering gifts, and finding a way to his heart. Antony, a simpler nut to crack, understood he was clever but more a brave soldier than a shrewd politician. Cleopatra adjusted her behavior accordingly. A bit of crude military humor, participation in mischievous escapades, and she became his trusted ally, with deep pockets to boot. No matter that not long ago, she was choosing whose side to embrace based on the victor of the Roman skirmish. The renowned Italian historian Guglielmo Ferrero summarized his view of Cleopatra as utterly cold and passionless, by nature incapable of genuine emotion. Myth 5, The Ideal Wife after getting involved with Caesar, Cleopatra waged war against her formal husband and brother, Ptolemy. Fighting against the Romans and their allies, Ptolemy XIII drowned. Enjoying life with Caesar, the queen arrived in Rome. 
During her stay, she became the object of annoyance for all of Caesar's enemies, and often, even his allies. The cup overflowed when a group of conspirators assassinated Caesar. Cleopatra returned to Egypt, where her second formal husband and brother, Ptolemy XIV, met his demise. It's believed that he was poisoned, and this death was most advantageous to, naturally, Cleopatra. Fully supporting Mark Antony's whims, the Egyptian queen joined him in waging war against Octavian, the future Emperor Augustus. Along the way, through her schemes, she alienated many of Antony's allies. The war mirrored its preparation, filled with feasts and revelries. In the decisive naval battle at Actium, Cleopatra took command of a portion of Antony's fleet, about 200, almost half, of the largest ships outfitted in Egypt. Initially, these vessels did not engage in the battle, staying in reserve. However, when Octavian's fleet started gaining the upper hand, the Egyptian ships abandoned the battlefield altogether. Following his beloved's lead, a defeated Antony fled, his tragic end was just a matter of time. Myth 6, died rather than live without her beloved. Mark Antony and Cleopatra, in the capital of Egypt, lost hope for victory and anticipated Octavian's invasion. To pass the time, they constantly indulged in feasts and vowed to die together. However, when Octavian's legions did enter Alexandria, this vow remained unfulfilled. Antony truly fell on his sword, but Cleopatra allowed herself to be captured. According to most historians, she tried to pull her signature move. She supposedly attempted to seduce Octavian, the successor to her first famous lover and the enemy of her second. But this battle was lost from the start. On one side, there was a 39-year-old mother of four, on the other, not the simple soldier Antony, but a cunning, calculated, and ruthless ruler. Cleopatra's story ended when she realized why Octavian kept her alive, to showcase her in a triumph. In the victor's parade, she was to play the role of a trophy and a museum exhibit, alongside elephants and exotic plants. The queen took her own life, and possibly that of two of her maids, using poison, either from a snake or concealed in her clothing. Regardless, with her demise ended the history of Cleopatra, the Ptolemaic dynasty, and Egypt's independence. The victors had no more interest in playing games with mistresses or puppet queens. P.S. A common argument supporting myths about Cleopatra is that her victorious enemies slandered her. Of course, enemies adjusted views about this woman, but it's important to remember this was the ancient world. Without mass media, it was difficult to spread blatant lies among people who were direct witnesses to events. Therefore, while taking some opinions with a grain of caution, it's still worth trusting the views of Cleopatra VI Philippator's contemporaries. Certainly, much more than Hollywood directors.